Hello, everyone. This is going to be episode two of our series of on Ralph Warnham. He was the second major modern critic of Paulinism. He wrote a book in London in 1877 entitled Saul of Tarsus, subtitled Or Paul and Swedenborg. And uh, he was uh, a man of uh, some renown. He was a British artist. He was born in 1812. He ended up at his death for the last 20 years before he died. I think it was 20. He was the keeper and secretary of the National Gallery of London from 1855 until his death. So it's about 22 years. And uh, he was the son of Robert Warnham, a famous creator of what's called the pianoforte at that time, an advance in pianos. Uh, he studied at the University College of London. Maybe he knew Bentham. It's, it's possible. Uh, in 1832, he gave up plans to read for the bar and attended the studio of Henry Sass. And he became basically a, a sketch artist. And uh, his sketches are still sold to this day. And he has a couple of books that are still sold on Amazon on certain classical issues about art. So he's he was a very intelligent, very obviously well-respected person. And he wrote, uh, at the end of his life, he wrote The Soul of Tarsus, the book we're reading, and it was reviewed in the uh, uh, Wikipedia as saying uh, that he was a member of the New Church, though a as a non-separatist, meaning he remained in communion with the Church of England. In this book, he expressed the notion of conflict between the teaching of Christ and the theology of St. Paul. And that's Wikipedia, but it cites the Dictionary of National Biography and in the uh, earlier first episode, I showed you that the actual words that Wikipedia did not re include was, it's it, he expressed the notion, it said, uh, of a st strongly, uh, strongly uh, notion of a strong conflict between the teachings of Christ and the theology of St. Paul. So for some reason, Wikipedia softened it down. Anyway, regardless, uh, he is basically, um, you know, a, a just one slight generation ahead or, you know, next after Bentham. So this gives you an idea that maybe Bentham's had an influence. And this is one of the first products of it. Somebody of the uh, the pe people who write books in, those, in that era and people who were of some renown and reputation, they were starting to write in this subject area. Okay, so we're going to start with page three. Uh, took us a little while to get through the uh, last one, but we'll we'll try to go quickly here. Uh, the contradictory accounts of Paul's conversion in the Acts, he gives no account of it himself, are in themselves a calamity fatal to the credibility of that legend. So in consistent with what we were doing last time, we're numbering what are the factual claims he's making, and then we have to see, does he back it up? He says, you're going to see this is addressed in chapter 5. So we may even want to jump ahead and take a look at chapter 5 one of these days. But he's saying that if you go there, the you will see contradictory accounts of Paul's conversion acts. We see that's also a strong argument that uh, we've already seen how that's true in uh, Bentham's uh, analysis in his book, Not Paul, But Jesus. Um, and then he calls these contradictions a calamity fatal to the credibility of the legend. And I think that would be exactly what uh, Jeremy Bentham was saying. And he, he's a renowned expert on evidence. So here you have two very reputable men concluding the same thing about the story. doesn't make the fact they agree make it true or not. It's what's the weight of the evidence. So we'll have to wait and take a look at that. Then uh, page four or three and four, he says, when the gospels are explained in their internal or spiritual sense, for as part of the word, they have an internal sense as expounded by Swedenborg. So he, he likes this. Uh, he was apparently a Christian, good Christian. And he wrote commentaries on the Bible. He might have actually been sort of like a Protestant when there was no Protestantism. I don't know yet uh, because uh, he wasn't writing from a Catholic worldview. Um, and I think he was writing in the 1600s. So I think he might have been somewhat Protestant. I don't know yet. Uh, as showing how absolutely inseparable are faith and charity. So he says, when the Gospels are explained in their internal or spiritual sense, they're, they're absolutely inseparable, the concepts of faith and charity. But this is incompatible. There's an incompatibility of Pauline dogmatism. So what he's talking about is the, obviously the parable of the sheep and the goats, where Jesus says, those who call me Lord, Lord, but 
don't do charity for the brothers and sisters, uh, you know, those who uh, need food, clothing, water, uh, and, and visits in prison, but you don't do anything for them. And uh, Jesus calls those people the goats. And uh, then Jesus says to the, uh, to the sheep who he's going to give them the kingdom and they're going to have eternal life. And they say, well, you know, did we see you? We didn't remember you saying, um, doing this for you, Lord Jesus, right? And this is what they're surprised. Like, why are you saying we've done all these things for you? Well, he says, the, if you did it to the least of these, my brethren and sisters, then you've done it for me. So clearly he's telling them you have eternal life in response to the charity you did. Then he turns to the goats and he said, you called me Lord, Lord, but you didn't do any of this. And they'll say, well, when did we see you uh, needing food, water and clothing? Well, he said, you didn't do it for the least of my brethren. You didn't do it for me. So you're going to go to the fire reserved for the devil and his angels. So, I mean, it, it didn't matter. You called him Lord. It didn't matter. You had faith. So this this parable is a crusher for the Paulinists. And if I told you all the ridiculous explanations they have, you would know it's a crusher because uh, I have a whole chapter in my book, uh, Jesus' Words on Salvation, free online. Just go over to the uh, website and look for Jesus' Words on Salvation. And what they say, one example just to give you is that, oh, well, that, that was just a gospel that was in effect before he ascended into heaven but when he when the Jews rejected him, these principles of you know doing righteousness were all gone. So that was one way. Then they had another view, which is it was in effect up till 70 AD when the temple fell, and therefore when the temple fell, the old regime died, and these principles of righteousness for salvation went away. And I mean, oh, just made up stuff. And and I review all these theories, but ultimately the only honest person was one commentator, uh, the uh, uh, J Joseph Dillow in his book, uh, Reign of the Servant Kings, he says, it's impossible to reconcile this with the gospel of faith. We just must assume that there's some way these reconcile. <laughs> but he meant we have to stick with Paul. And now you're going to see a person like this gentleman, Mr. Warnham, he's saying we don't stick with Paul. We go with Jesus. And, and he's saying that it's inevitable that this is where it's going to go, because now people can read got to remember, people could not read scripture for 1,500 years. It was kept from them. And part of it was technological. But now with technology allowing everybody to read, you can't keep this stuff bottled up anymore. It's getting out there. People are able to read the sheep and the goats and go, this doesn't sound like Paul. You just don't realize how different our world is from just 20, 30 years ago. I mean, I grew up where, you know, we didn't have computers. We used to write on pieces of paper. And you can't possibly keep tra track of things like we do today that stay there in our computers forever, you know. So anyway, so he's saying, point eight he has is, faith alone is against the gospel's inseparability of faith and charity. He's obviously speaking of the parable of the sheep and the goats. Let's go on. Okay, so uh, now we're on pages four to five. Uh, his the excerpt is, the question now is whether any benefit can accrue to Christianity from the dualistic teaching of Paul and his practical separation of faith and charity, and whether it is not full time to search the Gospels for the true substitute of what the Christian world has been hitherto content to accept as Christianity through the false medium of the Pauline epistles. So he's actually uh, encouraging the idea that we need it's time to stop using the false medium of the Pauline epistles to bring people to Christianity. For he's basically saying there's no benefit any longer to his dualistic teaching, and we'll see what he means by dualistic teaching, which separates faith and charity. So why would you want to approach people with the gospel that says, here's how to get saved and give them Paul? Then you have to unteach them from that and teach them Jesus' doctrines in the parable of the sheep and the goats which charity is essential. You're gonna, it's going to be such a discordant message. You're going to say, hey, you conned me. You said I had to do nothing. Now you tell me I have to do charity. I have to help people. Oh my gosh, what? This is, a, this is not what you, I didn't buy into this. So basically, yes, sometimes you have to have a, a, a message that has some cost. To, to have a message that has no cost means you're using Paul to what? Dupe people in, and then you want to give them Jesus? That's that's in essence what it's going to appear to people, and that's what 
uh, I would conclude if I, if I was a person led into Christianity, but now the people are, you know, we're starting to say, hey, we need to teach what Jesus teaches. No, if you don't do it from the very beginning, you, you just don't do it at all. You can't start with Paul and then switch. So this whole idea, you know, put up your hand, the salvation, you know, sinner's prayer, all of that mechanism is all to emphasize this is easy. It's a one-time thing. There is no discipleship you need. It isn't even about discipleship. It's just believe in facts. This is inimical to the message of Jesus Christ. So we have to find a new formula, a new approach, and hopefully we're going to learn what they think this, this gentleman, Warnham, believes is the new approach. And I will say this. I like something a little bit more about him than I do Bentham. I, I Bentham's very good. But Bentham is not a actual, I mean, he's he likes Jesus Christ. But he isn't coming from what this person is a member of a, basically of a you know in England you have to be Anglican okay you have to be like a that's Catholicism without um, without the Pope but he's part of a separatist church that means he's pro, he's a true Protestant what we would call an evangelical Protestant so he is somebody who's looking at things the way we want to look at Paul the way we think it should be done. And so I think we're going to find him having a little bit more of a spiritual message than we will get from Bentham. On the other hand, Bentham is a fantastic analyst, and we can learn from him a lot about how to detect things. So, uh, and so that I just want to give you an idea that doing Bentham and Warnham at the same time will show us a contrasting a point of view that gives, is going to give us different ways of saying similar things. Uh, both are critical of Paul, but coming from somewhat different pos positions. Okay, so uh, I think this is something we need to say to people. You know, it's time to stop using Paul to to reach out to people. We need to use Jesus Christ's message, and then we got to we'll say, well, what is that message? Well, then just quote. L let's learn to quote Jesus, and it isn't just saying, you know, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the meek. It's things like. Uh, you know, how did Zacchaeus get saved? How did Zacchaeus get saved? Well, Jesus said, hey, you know, he repented and he said, I'm going to return fourfold all the money as a tax collector I stole from these people and I'm going to give it to the poor, which is actually a law in the book of Moses or a, an example in the law of Moses when you, you can't find the person you originally stole from. You're supposed to take the money instead of adding 20 percent, returning it to the person you stole from. You have to now multiply it by four and pay that into the poor box in the community. So it goes to the poor. So this is these are things you learn. And then you learn how to say these things and tell people, you know, this is what Jesus would say to do and, and so on. So, you know, that's Jesus is is somebody who teaches. He's not someone who's saying, believe these facts about me and you're going to go to heaven. That's actually misleading people to say, to say, believing in some facts is going to save you. So we have to ourselves gain conviction that what Jesus says is true. What Jesus is saying is, as the prophet, God said, the prophet will come and every word he says is, a, is coming from me. That's Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 18. And that's what Peter says in Acts 3, verses 21 to 23, Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. And then he quotes those three verses from Deuteronomy 18. So we need to we need to learn these things in order to explain to people why everything Jesus says is important, even if it's just simply, you know, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a principle of righteousness. And if people say, well, we can't be righteous, you know, well, you know, Jesus says, be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. So he, he wouldn't tell us to do something we can't do. Oh, you're saying we can be perfect. Well, Jesus says we can be perfect. Oh, only by the atonement. Mm, he didn't say that. He was he was literally saying the Pharisees fail to to teach the law. And they are um, basically he was basically contrasting them and saying they don't teach the law. They don't teach mercy uh the judgments of the law which means right and wrong and they did not teach uh, pistis and, and 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 okay i'm gonna leave it there let's just keep moving on here but you, we need to come up with a better way of thinking about how to approach uh, uh evangelism so that's what i'm hoping by putting our, all our heads together and you put out your comments and things you think that people need to think about uh, as we go through these the Bent Bentham list of uh, the Bentham book and the Warnham book. All right, next. The word of the Lord is accepted by the church, but says Swedenborg, it has 
explained it through the medium of the Pauline epistles, and hence, though it receives the truth of faith, it receives everywhere from the good of charity. So what he's saying here is that basically, yeah, we, we once we're in the church, we accept the word of Christ, but then when you have the Pauline epistles in the midst of us and people want to take and subtract from what you just said, they'll use that. And so in, in, as a result, it then causes a recession and or a, a direction away from giving charity to our brothers. And, and I'll tell the story again. I, I, I was uh, going to the Christian church in Westwood Hills, and I remember I was asked to be in char- put in charge of the uh, Christian Action Committee, which is des- which I was told was supposed to promote uh, activity among the young people. So we had, you know, gr- group of young people from uh, UCLA, and I was, you know, 35, 40 years old. I mean, I'm a single man, but I'm, you know, I- I'm knowledgeable about the Bible and stuff. So, so I guess they put me there. And uh, and I was excited. You know, I'll I'll take the kids out and we'll go do uh, you know evangelism with food uh, to the homeless. And and that was it. Just so let's just bring some apples, bring some bananas, bring peanut butter sandwiches. And people did this. Everybody liked it. But I was scolded. <laughs> Why? What happened? I went there and the Methodists were already set up there, and we worked cooperatively with them and with the Methodists, which you know, as far as I know, there there's nothing radical about the Methodists. And um, but our church was very simple. We believed in the Bible, we believe in Jesus Christ, and we believe I can't remember, it's three prongs. It's a very simple doctrine to the church. The, the it's called the Christian church. And um so yeah, but I got in trouble. And so I was told, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to read these books on on Christian missions abroad and and how to do ministry but you know you don't you don't do that you know okay to me this is crazy yes that's exactly what we should do if jesus says do it let's go on and do it It, and is it is it offensive if there's another christian group present in the in the you know i would hope there's other christians at the park down near near the santa monica pier and in that area and we were walking around you these people were glad to hear about it they would love to hear it they're in they're down in the dumps I just didn't get it, but yeah. So we never went again. That was that was the pastor's direction to me. Okay. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we everywhere the Pauline epistles are preached goes and what happens it recedes everywhere from the gospel of charity that Jesus taught. Next, page five. May we not re- inquire whether the Pauline epistles have not quite served their useful purpose, and being now no longer needed by the church in its new dispensation, should not be henceforth excluded from the word, of which, as Swedenborg explains, they constitute no part as wholly wanting the internal spiritual sense. Okay, so he's what I think he's saying is the Pauline epistles have served their useful purpose to this point, but now they're no longer needed. So it's sort of like he's turning in reverse this whole idea about, uh, the. remember Paul said you had the law as a schoolmaster, but now you no longer need it. Well, he's trying to actually turn that kind of principle around on Paul. I thought it was kind of funny, actually. If, if It's almost like an inside joke. So, you know, Paul, you said the law was a schoolmaster for a time, and then we could get rid of We could dump God's word there. You know what? Maybe you're, you're exactly like the law, Paul. You were good for a time, but we, we've outgrown you, Paul. And uh, I think that's uh, maybe the, yeah, a, a kind of an in, inside joke he's making there. I don't know. Um, so then he says, we should now henceforth exclude Paul from the word, meaning take him out of the Bible. Yeah, and I'm beginning to think that uh, that's really the best way to do it and maybe have a separate booklet that has call, called the uh, the uh, heretical writings of of Paul, <laughs> something like that, so that people know that we're not promoting Paul. These are heretical writings we need to know about because it helps understand how Satan attacked the church through this man. Presumably, we're giving him the benefit, I give him the benefit of the doubt that he was a dupe, okay? Although he was a dupe, had a very poor, poor character, and was willing to lie and cheat and even defend it as theologically necessary and justifiable. So it's, and he doesn't hide it from you, which means he's an honest liar. Does that make any sense? Somebody's telling you, I'm going to lie for the gospel. 
Romans 3, 7. If I, if I lie to advance the gospel, why am I still called a sinner? That was his remarks. And in 1 Corinthians 8 and in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, you know, I, I'll be everything to all people. I'll be a Jew. I'll be a, a, a non-Jew. I'll be a Gentile in order to get gain more for Christ. He's literally saying, for this, and for the sake of gospel, he'll be anything anybody needs me to be, meaning I'll put on the falsest face I have to appear this way or that way or the, the other way, no, so that just to save more people. But wait a minute, you have to have integrity, Paul. So anyway, this is the problem with Paul, and he's no longer a good example for us. And we need to now, so he says, Paul's writings have no part with Jesus, and thus they lack the internal spiritual sense of Jesus. That's in essence what he's saying. So let's see if there's anything else here. Okay. Uh, this may be the last one. No, no. We're gonna, oh, the next last part. The last is the position taken up in the following essay where it is attempted to show that Paul was a veritable sower of tares. Okay, so I think when he says following essay, it must be that's his first chapter perhaps. Uh, as he was reputed to be of old. Now he's referring that he obviously must know that the Ebionites believed that Paul was uh, a tear and he was the enemy. Remember an enemy sowed these tares in the evening while you were away? Well, this was the Hebrew Matthew, the commentaries on the Hebrew Matthew had it that the Ebion, which we now know are our original church for sure due to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they believe that there was the enemy. And he was he was called the spouter of lies, which transparently in the Dead Sea Scrolls is Paul. And um, so, yeah, so he was very well known as that to be the enemy. But this is before the Dead Sea Scrolls. So uh, there was an account also, it might have been in the Clementine homilies, I can't remember where it is, where, yes, they said Paul was the enemy who sowed the tares in the field. Remember in that parable, Jesus says, don't try to rip them out now, you know, the, the tares. The, leave that for the angels at the end of time to, to basically sift them out and expel them. So in other words, I think what Jesus was saying there that we can apply today is we need to leave them in the church. Don't do to them what they do to us. They try to exclude us. We, we can bear with them, but we are going to unite with Christ, in Christ. We're going to hold the fort for Jesus this time. The old, the old, uh, 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 the old way of thinking is, you know, to try to blend in. That's not right. We need to say, hey, you know, we need to start teaching Jesus. We need to go back to what Jesus taught us. These th these things don't mesh together well. And if they don't understand what you're saying, just say, hey, take a look at these books. Send them a link to one of them, and they'll start reading. They can read with us, go along with us, and see what's happening. See what's what people who've given good thought to it they believe. So now, what does he say as the problems, the tares? He actually uses doctrines to describe tares, not false believers or false, uh, uh, you know, activities, but actually false doctrines. And the first thing he mentions is dualism, and we're going to discuss that in a minute because I, it's a little tricky what that might be, mean. I think we all know what predestination is. And that actually has one component, which is complete blasphemy. That's predestination of the lost, which means God, before you were born, took away your free will to f freely accept a, a life of following God. Even, even though you did no sin, nothing. You haven't even committed one sin in your life, but he's already determined you won't go to heaven. And so there's a predestination of the lost, or at least that's how Calvin found it to be. And um, But also, just in general, then predestination to salvation is kind of a crazy idea, too. You have no free will. When when you read the law, it says you have a, you have a way. You Today, you have a choice to make a, ch a decision to choose life, or you can choose death. Moses is very clear. You had a free choice. It's going to be your choice. God's not going to make it for you. We all have a free choice whether to choose God or not choose God. But that's not the way Paul re re says things. No, it's predestined. And you can only look backwards and go, oh, I can see how God was orchestrating everything. Yeah, God does orchestrate things. But he doesn't force you to come to faith. You have to do that. And he can draw you, but he cannot compel you. He cannot overcome. He will not overcome your will. You have to make a decision to follow the master, follow Yahweh. All right, so predestination, justification by faith, we know what that is. Imputation, I'm not sure what he means, and I don't think I really care. I think it's maybe imputation of righteousness. But uh, that, that, to me, that's just 
that's not big a big deal. Materialism, um, yeah, I guess you could say that, but I, to me, that's not uh, something that stands out when I think about Paul. Celibacy is definitely something that Paul seems to be suggesting f- for sure. You know, it's better your virgin doesn't get married. And interestingly, he says there, this is not a message from God, it's a message from me, but, you know, I think I have the Holy Spirit. To me, that's just like a giveaway, but you can't even convince a Paulinist there that the, Paul doesn't have inspiration when he's saying, I think I have the Holy Spirit. By its definition, by, those words mean he doesn't have the Holy Spirit for sure, and he's just saying, I think so, but I don't know so. But you can't convince a Paulinist no matter what. Anyway, um... And then all difficulties in the Christian church spring solely from the writings of Paul or the so-called Pauline epistles. So, yeah, I think we really think about it. All the division, all the 30,000 denominations are all because something Paul said triggers one, one group of people and they have to go in another direction and, whole, and others go in a different direction. He's caused fracture and, and division everywhere he's gone by his words. And he was also divisive in the original church, too, just so we know. Okay, I wanted to show you something uh, that he mentioned dualism, because that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I'm going to stop this recording for the moment, and I'll come right back. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm back. Um, so I just want to share with you that um, the dualism that uh, Warren was talking about that would be removed from the Bible is this idea that J- Jesus is a dual God, in the, in the, not even a dual God, a dual, like, angel type person uh, running the universe with God the Father. And um, so Jesus, uh, according to Paul, he represents a view that's neither compatible with Trinitarianism nor Unitarianism, that Jesus was the highest created being. So Jesus, according to Paul, is the highest created being ever. Uh, But he was not God. This is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 27 to 28. And Paul makes that clear when he explains that one day all things will be put under God, except Jesus will not put God himself under God. Those are Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, 27 through 28. So Jesus is not God, according to Paul, and when he puts all things under Christ, all things will be put under Christ, except God won't be put under Christ. So he makes a point of that. God is above and excludes Jesus. So he sees a complete dual nature. There's... There's Jesus, this very uh, high-level angel-type quality person, and he says he's the first begotten of the Father. So he's he's in, he's like an angel who's first begotten. And this is why there are Christians who actually defend the argument that Paul is just justifies viewing Jesus as an angel in the Septuagint translation of the uh, Isaiah nine six, which has some titles about a child will be born, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of his titles besides uh, everything else, is angel of great counsel. So they say that's who Jesus really is based on Paul, just to give you an idea. Okay, and the other thing is, uh, I think I mentioned this, is Paul says in 1 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, Colossians 1 verse 15, that Jesus is the firstborn of creation, so he's not eternal. He was born, created by God. Uh And then after that, then Jesus, after God created Jesus, then Jesus created everything else in Colossians 1.16. I mean, we could we could take a look at that if you want to see that. Um, oh, here, let's see if we can open that page and look at that. Colossians 1.16. Yeah, what does it say? Uh, For in him all things were created, things, this is about Jesus, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. That's Jesus we're talking about. So this is a person who was created. He was the first begotten. That's in the prior verse. And then this verse follows, that he's created everything else. And um, then what we find out is when we get dive deeper into who Paul is depicting Jesus as, um, he says uh, that Jesus at one point had an equality with God prior to his incarnation becoming flesh in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. And this teaching derives from Paul conceiving of a being distinct from the Father who had an equality with God, but who then empties himself. The Greek word is kenosis. They don't. They, they try to run away from this now. Of divine attributes to enter the world as one who had, quote, the appearance of men. So he wasn't really a man. 
He just wanted to look like one. So he emptied himself, though, of all his attributes that would make him godlike. So he seemed very human-like, but he really wasn't human. Um, and then he clearly said that Jesus was an eternal. We already mentioned that. He was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So Jesus the firstborn. And then in Colossians 1.16, Jesus then says, this created being, Jesus, uh, and Paul says, this created being, Jesus, in verse 15, he turns around and created all things. So, um, so as C. Anderson Scott in Christ's Christology and Dictionary of the Apostolic Church, 1915, at 1, 185, he says, Paul words in Colossians 1, 15 mean he himself, Jesus, was part of creation. Of course, that's the only way you can read it. Um, so this is why some people think that Jesus is just an angel. You know, and in fact, in Isaiah 9, 6, if you believe Septuagint is reliable, it says uh, his name will be called Angel of Great Counsel, for I'll bring peace upon the princes and health to him. So that's all it says in the Septuagint. It doesn't say a lot of the things you think. It says apparently in that time period, maybe there were some additions later. I don't know. Um, okay, so so that could be one of the reasons why Paul did not believe Jesus was God is the way Isaiah 9, 6 read, Isaiah 9, verse 6 read in the Septuagint. Um, but in Psalm 102, verse 22 to 34, we mentioned this in an article on this, is uh, God spoke to another God saying, Lord, at the beginning you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. And this appears to be, and this is in the Septuagint mistranslation, but a lot of people believe it's a good translation. Um, but uh, anyway, so that you have two gods in this, due to this mistranslation of Psalm 102. And that's, you know, again, goes back to this idea, you, you've got a begotten God and a God who was the father of that first begotten God. And then the first begotten God creates the heavens and the earth comes to earth, empties himself out. This is a completely uh, pagan uh, doctrine, meaning you've got pagan, this is paganism, you know, <laughs> you've got the same thing with the horse god, and then the sun god, and he creates things. And then um, in the, the story of Dionysius, you have him emptying himself of the attributes of being the son, the true son of God. He comes to earth, he has to live a human life, and then, you know, he, he can die and then be resurrected and come back. I mean, so Paul had this uh, very a pagan dualism, so to speak, of a, of a created being who had all these godlike attributes, somewhat like an angel, who then comes to earth, empties himself out. So very strange dualism, uh, and, and, but it unfortunately has impacted Christianity to a great extent, and a lot of our doctrines seem to reflect the same attitudes. Okay, anyway, uh, so that's going to be enough on this uh, episode. And I uh, hope this was interesting and, and uh, educational. And we'll continue with uh, Warnham in the next episode. God bless. Take care. Ciao.